This game has a special place in my heart. It's the first CRPG I think I played after Fallout 1. And I don't even think I was that excited to get it when it came out, to be honest. And like I said in my last video, I wasn't all that into games back then. You know, it was a hobby. But this was the first game where I felt like I was actually role-playing in a game. Like I created a character and I role-played as that character. It was the first time I felt like that. Even with Fallout, it took me a few times to play that game to actually get that feeling. But I felt like while I was playing Baldur's Gate, I was writing my own story. In fact, the How To series is all pretty much inspired by the way that I used to play this game in particular. And I remember it fondly because it was a way for me to play D&D without having friends to play D&D with, right? Because it's not that I didn't have friends, it's that I had friends but none of them were interested in this ultra nerdy shit that I was into. So all of my little hobbies and everything, they were kind of like self-indulgent hobbies because it wasn't like I was doing them to socially interact with anybody else. I just want you to imagine weird ass, awkward ass, smelly ass, 18 year old me sitting down at my computer to play Baldur's Gate, right? And whenever I'm trying to intimidate somebody in the game, I just stop and I start acting like a badass, like, you're gonna give me what I want, motherfucker. And there's nobody around to see me do this, but I'm doing it anyway. I mean, I'm literally playing to a crowd of zero, but I'm having a fucking blast. Like, like I really just think that I was doing all this stuff because I really like to act. And this game really allows you to do that. Baldur's Gate is a difficult game to talk about. On one hand, it's one of my favorite RPGs. There's a lot of reasons for this, and not all of them are legitimate. Like, gonna be honest right now, gonna be real hard for me to identify my nostalgia and form legit critiques. This game was made to appeal to two different fan bases. Reportedly, the dev team were making this game in an engine they were unfamiliar with, with little to no documentation, and suddenly Blizzard drops Diablo and everybody in the office is like, hey, uh, does anybody else think our game's boring now? Must make Diablo. So, all the people in the office shouting turn-based combat were drowned out by the people shouting boo at the top of their lungs. So we got real-time with pause combat, and let me tell you, this was pretty damn novel at the time. Up to that point, RPGs were either top-down strategy or side-view turn-based. No one had even tried to do all this real-time. The way combat works in Baldur's Gate is fairly simple. Each round in Dungeons & Dragons takes a certain amount of time. Some say six seconds, some say two. Either way, within that time frame, Every enemy and player character can take an action, and each action has a set amount of time it takes to perform that action. So, for instance, hitting someone with a melee attack can happen in a single round, while casting a spell might take two. And the feature that makes all of this work is the pause feature. You pause the game, assign commands, and watch them get carried out. And up to now, there's been a lot of work on this formula, a lot of improvement over the years. In fact, JRPGs took that system and ran with it in later Final Fantasy titles, albeit with better control schemes than these ports have. And the Baldur's Gate version has some really clunky controls if you're playing on console, and I'm sure you could get used to it if you have to, but I prefer the platform it was designed for. So I went out and bought the Enhanced Edition on Steam when it came out, and I never touched it. I've already played this game, and honestly, I wasn't all that fond of it when I did play it the first time. I liked BG2 better in almost every way, but we'll get to those comparisons. So part of me was looking forward to coming back to this game to see if it still held up to my previous impressions of it, and the other part of me is dreading the inevitable backlash as I tear this game a new pooper. So, let's dig in, shall we? But before we get started, some of you asked me a question in the last video, and it was not phrased politely. Some of you were angry, some of you were puzzled, so I'm going to address it here. Some of you didn't like that I skipped over some of the house missions in New Vegas, so let me tell you why. I did this because the video would have been too long. Daddy has to keep up the grind, so he has to put one out every month, whether he thinks it's done or not. But there is a solution. If you'd like to see longer videos, you know what you should do? Head over to my Patreon, kick me a buck. Every dollar helps keep me off the stripper pole. And with less reliance on ads, I would no longer need to worry about the length and production time of my videos. If this interests you, hit it up. Go take a look, bask in its outdated glory. Anyway. The first thing you're probably going to notice about this game is that it opens with a title crawl, much like Star Wars, right? But what this is supposed to represent is a DM giving you all the background to the story of the campaign that you're about to play. This game is trying to give you that pen and paper experience with its limited resources. The scripting language for this game wasn't exactly robust, so there's not a whole lot in the way of the player creating their own story. Really, that has to happen in the background with the player's imagination because the game leaves a lot up to your imagination. 
So anyway, the text crawl. This thing's gonna tell you everything you need to know about the game before you start playing. Nestled atop the cliffs that rise from the Sword Coast, the Citadel of Candlekeep houses the finest and most comprehensive collection of writings on the face of Farron. The game starts in Candlekeep, a library slash fortress that's home to one of the largest collections of scrolls and books in all of Faerun. The keep is also home to the Avowed, which are a ragtag band of scholars headed by some guy named Alondo. Does any of this matter in game? No, sure don't, because the game never really addresses it, nor do any of these groups ever show themselves because this section is just a tutorial. It's all it ever was. It is an imposing fortress kept in strict isolation from the intrigues that occasionally plague the rest of the Forgotten Realms. That's right, we got a lot of rules about this community. No golf carts, no skateboards, no kids under 16, and no loud music and cars. It's perfect. It's the best place to come to study. You have been told that you are an orphan but your past is largely unknown. See, this game subverts the amnesia trope. You see, you're not an amnesiac, you're an orphan. You just don't remember who your parents are. And why would you? Shit, your dad wasn't there. He was out there getting low-income single women pregnant. There's also why I never open a door without knocking three times. Two and three are for people to get their pants on. I mean, I know we don't look like it, but the god of murder, he's a real charmer when he's drunk. You now stand before the Candlekeep Inn, ready to purchase what you need for an unplanned and unexpected journey. And after a long exposition dump, we finally get a chance to see what this game looks like. You gotta keep in mind that this game came out at a time when monitors can only render everything in 4.3 and it was at a 1024 resolution, you know what I mean? And people were still super fond of using up half of the fucking screen's real estate on UI elements. Like, you were rocking it pretty hard if you were playing this game full screen. And I gotta say, for Bioware's first attempt at this kind of game, it's pretty damn good looking. And it set a bar for all the games that would come after it, like Planescape Torment, Icewind Dale, and Baldur's Gate 2. But you might be noticing something here and you're like, I don't understand what the fuck is going on with your cursor right now. And yo, you'd be right, 100%. I don't know what the fuck's going on with this game, but Beamdog must have put this thing together with duct tape. Because seriously, this thing's like barely holding together. When you record, it's like your UI elements are offset from the center of where they are. And it makes everything really confusing to see. So I'm sorry about that, but this doesn't actually happen in game. In game, it looks completely fine and it even feels like it runs fine. It's just that the recorded footage is just fucking weird. The other thing I need to mention too is that since this is the enhanced edition, it's a uh, beam dog and beam dog, I don't know why, they felt like when they're doing a remaster or an enhanced edition, that they needed to add a bunch of stuff to this game and not make it optional to play with. They added characters, they added storylines, they added quests, they added all kinds of stuff. And I'm gonna see if I could tell what's changed just by comparing the quality of the two things. It's been a while since I've played this game, but I have a good feeling that I'm gonna be able to pick out new content about 70 80 percent of the time we'll, we'll see because i'm wondering if the content is as bad as some of the people say it is right so if it's as bad as people are saying it is it should stand out because the writing in this game is pretty damn solid i just have to say it again i hate it when people do this it's it's changing the history of games it really is this is probably the only version that a lot of new players are going to actually play right if they can manage to get the old version to play for them you know, Godspeed. But this is the obviously better one, right? Because it runs at higher resolutions. A lot of the stuff was remastered to play at those higher resolutions. It's a really good port, but the thing is, they change so much shit that it's no longer the same experience. So those that are new to the genre or new to this game in particular, they're gonna be like, what the fuck, you know? If the content's bad, you run the risk of giving a bad impression of a game that was excellent before you screwed with it. It's just a lose-lose. You don't gain out of this. Old players are almost guaranteed to hate it, and new players are gonna be looking at it and not understanding why something doesn't feel right, why things don't match. And the reason things feel different is because these two pieces, this dialogue here and this character over here, they were both written at two totally different time periods in history, which means that they're going to have different political and social sensibilities in the dialogue, like embedded within the text. You know what I mean? You never cross the same river twice, time marches on, all that shit. Like, I don't know what the fuck it is about the world anymore, but everybody's trying to put a fucking fresh coat of paint all over history. I don't get it. 
Now this place is an overgrown tutorial. There's really nothing much to explore here. You can't even go into the tower. You can only explore the outskirts and all the little houses that are found outside this ring. And in two of them are people trying to kill you and the rest are just literal tutorials. Like come in here and kill a bunch of enemies without consequence, you can't die. And I'll just keep summoning up new ones for you to fight, right? It's a place for you to practice your skills and get a little bit of extra EXP and maybe some extra gold for the journey. Where the real loot is, is in all these chests, right? And I love these little areas that are right above taverns usually because there's people in there that are sleeping, there's people in there that are guarding their stuff, and they're pretty suspicious of you when you walk in. And it's not about the reality of this gameplay scenario because there's not really much interactivity to be had here. Like, if you just walk in and force open this guy's lock, he's not going to wake up. He's not going to wake up for anything. That guy's out fucking cold. The fact of the matter is, the first time I played this, I didn't know that. And I was sneaking into these rooms trying to be stealthy while stealing stuff out of their drawers. The game had convinced me that it was better than it actually was. Just because it really immersed me in its themes and its tabletop nature. Especially with that opening cinematic. Basically, the game was convincing enough to make me paranoid. And if you end up getting caught trying to break into somebody's stuff, they'll call the guards on you, which is great. Like, the world actually reacts to what you do. Like, I remember at the time when this game came out that these kinds of interactions were pretty damn near non-existent. Other CRPGs just didn't have this level of interactivity, right? Because like in Fallout, there was only a few places where if you were stealing from somebody, you'd get caught. But in this game, it seems pretty damn consistent. The rules seem consistent, at least so far. Wait, there is something wrong. We are in an ambush. Prepare yourself. This game's voice acting is real nice. You're perceptive for an old man. You know why I'm here. Hand over your ward and no one will be hurt. If you resist, it shall be a waste of your life. You're a fool if you believe I would trust your benevolence. Step aside and you and your lackeys will be unhurt. I'm sorry that you feel that way, old man. That voice you're hearing, with bass so deep that it reverberates inside your head, that's the voice of Kevin Michael Richardson. You really know how to spoil a coming out party. The voice of Joker and Jerome. But hang on, first I gotta adjust myself. See, a lot of these older games, they had some of the best voice actors in Hollywood on their games. Like, Daddy, will you wipe me? We got Jim Meskimen doing Khalid. We got Jim Cummings doing Minsk. And Gray Delisle Griffin as Viconia. I just wanted to draw attention to it because it really is like a feast for your ears. Now this mission right here, it really does sum up the quality of some of these side quest missions. Basically it consists of this. Hey, how are you? My name is so-and-so. We either know each other or we don't. Hey, can you do me a favor? I left my shit over there. Can you go grab it for me? So you go over there and you grab their shit and then you come back and you bring it back to them and they go, hey, thanks for bringing my shit. Here's some money. Bye now. This is not a game where you form long lasting bonds and relationships. In fact, even your companions will just get fed up with your shit and leave or fight you. So the side quests aren't really worth doing in a lot of cases. So I'm not even going to cover them because like I said, they're not really even worth doing, let alone worth talking about. So this armored guy and his lackeys try and kill my dad. And not only do they try, but they also succeed. The dawn is especially cruel this morning. You awake with the realization that you have not been living some horrible dream. That's right. This was no horrible dream. You actually slept outside. And waiting for us when we wake up is Imowen, our sister. The one that won't go away even if you say nicely, get the fuck away from me. A little further up the road, you'll meet a necromancer and an assassin. And before that, you meet a weird guy in a red shirt and an apron walking around the woods by himself talking to people about their manners. Like, what the hell's with this dude? And that guy? Yeah, he's just like a tutorial. He's like a signpost, basically, in human form. He's there to tell you that if you're mean to people, they'll be mean to you. So if you're one of those kind of people that's always asking themselves, I don't understand what's wrong with people. I can't make new friends. I can't hold on to friends. Well, maybe this is for you. A child wandering the wilderness, surely you must not be none too bright to be traveling these roads. This dude is insulting my fucking intelligence and I just met him. And now they're insulting my clothes? 
Oh, now they want to offer me some healing potions. Well, I got news for you, dude. I don't drink out of anybody else's bottle, man. I don't know where that bottle's been. I don't know what holes you've put that bottle into. And people, let me tell you, they get up to some shit, man. They be putting bottles in all kinds of holes, okay? I'm not the kind of guy to just take a strange bottle and put it in my mouth. Don't take offense, asshole. I'm just saying, you know... You're just some weird fucking dude I met in the woods offering me a potion. Fuck off. I've seen Disney movies before. I see how this shit ends. The moment you pop over to the next map, you're going to meet a guy in a red cloak with a big red hat. His just, name is just Old Man, but let me tell you something. That ain't just an old man. That's Elminster. Elminster's had quite a few books written about him and he's a pretty well-known figure in the Forgotten Realms. Just like with every hero in the Forgotten Realms, he's probably the reason why the place hasn't blown up yet. This dude's so good at magic, right? And he's so well-known that Mistra, the mother of all magic, you know, the greater deity, the one that died and made 4th edition D&D so fucking shitty, aka the hottest goth housewife you've ever seen. Yeah, this is her favorite dude. He's so goddamn famous in Faerun that it's impossible for him to go anywhere and still be known as just some old man. I mean, look at the guy. Does he look like he can blend in with a crowd? Oh there, Wanderer. Stay thy course a moment to indulge an old man. It's been nigh into a ten days since I've seen a soul walk in this road, and I've been without decent conversation since. Traveling nowadays appears to be the domain of either the desperate or the deranged. If thou wouldst pardon my intrusion, may I inquire which pertains to thee? And I'm not insane. My mother had me tested. The first time he's met us and he's already asked us if we're crazy or not. Now see, that's a guy who gets right down to the fucking point, you know what I mean? Because that is the first thing you should ask every person you meet in Forgotten Realms. Like, are you crazy or are you not crazy? Please check yes or no. For the record, it could kill us to meet new people. And also what kind of crazy you are, you see? Because there's two different kinds of crazy in Forgotten Realms, right? There's fish mulk levels of crazy right like uh you know whimsical crazy and then there's just plain fucking evil crazy the journey to this place is mind numbing i mean you can explore these two maps thoroughly if you want but you're likely to get killed a lot but highly unlikely to run into anything of consequence there's an ogre here who has a belt fetish and if you kill him you'll automatically finish a quest when you get to the friendly arm in but i'm not kidding when i say the walk here is without reason i can understand making your player walk this far if there was some kind of significant challenge in getting to the destination but this is just pointless and boring and your reward for going through this tedium a boring town full of nothing the friendly arm in is another boring place there's nothing to do. It's just a place for you to come and grab some companions and one single side quest, which involves you going somewhere to kill something and returning that thing that the thing stole. Now remember this, because we're gonna come back to this soon. When you get here, it'll be too early because you likely rush straight here to get your companions. The game even tells you to do it on top of that. It shows you the direction you need to go. So the game doesn't throw you enough experience before you get to this town because this mage you're about to fight He's at least a level 3 because his magic missiles will one-shot any level 1 mage and can do the same to a fighter as well if he gets lucky. When you meet this asshole, you'll likely be level 1, but the game has a way past this. And something that I never noticed my first time through is how every planned fight that this game throws at you, meaning a fight that the game wants you to fight as opposed to a fight that a random spawn creates, each of these fights has a way to cheese it. And that's sort of the thing I like about this game in particular because it makes you feel like you've got like a super big fucking brain when you figure out a way to trick the AI or cheese the level design. And I'm not all that confident enough to say that this wasn't done on purpose. Because some people hate it when you trick the AI and they complain about it, whereas I'm grateful that this was left in because it makes me feel like I've defeated the game in another perhaps unintended way. But you can kind of tell by the design of this fight that they kind of meant for it to play out this way. I want in provision like the elves. But he's more than just taking their eyes. Since this mage is so obviously more powerful than I am, the way I kill him is by luring him over to where the guards are, and then as soon as he aggroes on me, the guards come after him. I'm using the environment to help me kill this guy. But sometimes the guards jump in and they can't hit a goddamn thing, so they're completely useless sometimes. And it's the problem with designing randomness in your game, right? Because even designed encounters that are meant to play out a certain way if the player figures something out, even those get ruined by the fact that it's completely up to random chance. This is why way more modern games lean on positive randomness instead of pure randomness, meaning it's random 
defend them, but weight it in a way that you'll most likely come out on top. Or to put it a more accurate way, weight it positively in the fact that all of your attacks will mostly succeed and occasionally fail. That way you know that the player is on the same footing as the enemy most of the time. It's a way to subvert the need for scaling encounters. Leave in a cheesy way for the player to kill something that they have no business killing at this level. It's really satisfying, actually. It's just not something that you can lean on too heavily because if you abuse this design methodology, then the player can figure out things much quicker and then it just becomes tedious for the player. It'll end up feeling more like you're playing a puzzle game than an RPG. Dungeons and Dragons doesn't care about your feelings. This game finds it funny when you die, just like some dungeon masters. As a level one player, a level three mage can one shot you with a single magic missile. If he was to attack with that magic missile first, the player would be dead before they could even react. Instead, the mage casts mirror image, then he casts fear on you, knowing that the guards may or may not kill him before they get their missiles off. The encounter was designed to be tense, and the NPC offers the same challenge each time. This is one of the things that this game does excellently, finely tuned encounters. It also offers you many other solutions to this problem. In fact, if you find the necromancer and assassin on the way here, it'll be a much fairer fight, with you hitting the mage so much that they can't get a shot off. It's an RPG that was designed a lot like M Sims at the time, and honestly, I think that was just the philosophy at the time, player agency. It's why almost every game from this time period is considered considered by journalists as an M-Sim. It's not that they are M-Sims, it's just because player agency was very important to this game's success and the design philosophy of a lot of companies at the time. Here to back at a tavern is Jahir and Khalid. They're a married couple, your typical beta male shacking up with an alpha female. And I'm not gonna lie, and I don't know what the hell this says about me, but something about her personality just had me, you know, I like a challenge. She Jahir is an old friend of our father guy, the guy who raised us but didn't actually have intercourse with our mother, which makes him instantly better than my real dad who did all those things inside of someone and probably didn't even wash his hands after. Now the thing that's always bothered me is that I feel like I never got to know who the hell these two people were until part two. I'm not saying I felt that way this time around, but in the past, it's just what I remember that this game dropped the ball with interesting stories. It'll be interesting to see if my opinion of that has changed at all. As for Jahira, she's a harper. The harpers are a bunch of tree people. You know, they live in trees, they talk to trees, and every now and then they've been known to hug a tree. They were formed by some druids and rangers along with some elves and their goal. Second edition D&D is interesting because of the time it takes place in. In the Forgotten Realms, 720 DR. It was the first reformation of the Harpers. See, the Harpers disband after whatever evil gone out of control is dealt with and balance and power is restored. This time they gathered in a druidic grove in Highdale. It was there that Elminster, yeah, that guy arrived and told everyone why the priests of so many different gods were gathered there the faithful of such evil cults such like bane ball and merkel were slaughtering its way from the south working its way up north killing elves and sacrificing them in strange rituals so they gathered the faithful of several gods like mistra salune and sylvanas in hopes that their followers would be able to call on them for aid and they did more than that they possessed the followers and gave them their blessings to fight back against the forces of evil gods. Now, does any of this appear in the game? Nope. Nothing appears in this game. All the good stuff? Yeah, that happens in part two. Who is Khalid then? Now, Khalid can be anyone you want because this dude's got no background. He's just there, married to my future ex-wife. And then there's this guy. Hmm. It's about time. Bring me another flagon of ale. I don't recognize you, you're new. Then why do you bother me? Wow, what a D-bag. Now do you remember how like I used to go on like a rant for an hour about how much I hate this trope that evil people are just assholes? Listen man, this does a disservice to evil, really. Some of the most fascinating characters in both history and narration, literature, they've all been nice guys, charming guys, who are also very much evil underneath of all of that, that all of their good intentions and everything, it was all because they were trying to get something for themselves, right? This guy, Zorn, Zork, whatever the fuck his name is, he, he falls into this trope that came later after this game where all evil people just needed to be outright evil so that the player could identify which one were evil by which ones were being assholes to them. And it's really just not very imaginative. And at the same time, 
it stands out, right? Because this isn't up to the level of writing that the game has been up to up until now, right? Like the two guys that you get that are from the Zentarum, they're subtle about the reasons that they're here and the groups that they belong to. In fact, they even try to act nice just to fool you. They definitely don't do that very trite and contrived thing that a lot of other games do where it's like shout out to the whole world. Hey everybody, I'm an evil asshole. Make sure you stop all of my evil plans. Subterfuge is the weapon of evil. It's not smart to go out and make fucking enemies everywhere you go. And it's not to say that you can't have characters who are just assholes. Like, yeah, those kinds of people do exist, but guess what? They got few friends and they usually travel alone. There's only one thing left to do here, and that's to kill a bunch of hobgoblins. And you know how these guys die? They die to sleep and tangling vines, followed by a peppering of arrows. Man, bows in this game, just like in real life, they're deadly. I mean, imagine just rolling down the street when one of your crew just out of nowhere, your half-orc mage Zork, is nailed right in the neck with a broadhead arrow. That guy's done. And then, in seconds, so is everyone else. With that knowledge in the forefront of your mind, people often seem confused as to why arrows are so strong in this game, and I'm confused that you're so confused. It's a big, sharp piece of metal flying at you at 225 feet per second. You have what I like to call adventure RPG brain rot. You are used to arrows and video games being weaker than swords in every way except distance. But let me tell you, an arrow will ruin your day and your future and your adventuring days if you catch it in your knee yo hey hey what do you know what do you say what do you do so knowing this if you come across some archers in a planned encounter watch out because something's going to try and stop you from closing distance and that'll either be a trap or the archers have magic arrows in which case it was nice knowing you call me when you make it to the hotel okay love you bye up to now the game has been pretty slow. And I know you might be thinking that because this game is a classic game that everybody brings up when they bring up their, you know, top 25 games of my entire life. You'd think that by this point, this is where the game picks up. And that would make sense, right? We've gone through three areas and the only thing that's happened to us is a guy tried to kill us. Some animals tried to kill us and someone tried to give us herpes, but my OCD heroically stepped in to prevent it. I am become death, destroyer of worlds! Then we got ourselves some help from some friends we don't know, and we've gone through another mostly empty forest to a, another town, and you would be forgiven for thinking that now, now is when the game is finally going to pull up its sack skin and get to work. But sadly, you'd be wrong. The first hour or so of gameplay in just about any game will determine whether the player keeps playing and Baldur's Gate is a lot like when your brother and you used to fight and he used to just hold you back by holding your forehead. This game's a lot like that. The closer you get to having fun, the further it seems to want to push you away. I have played this game a total of 15 times, but I've only beaten it twice. This is where I quit every time. Okay, not true. Sometimes I make it to Nashville Mines, but mostly I stop here. Why? Isn't it obvious yet? Baragos is where you might start to see some patterns forming. Now the quests, they're amazing. Here's how they work. You go up to a guy and he says, yeah, that's right. The famous asshole of the North lost his magic toilet paper in a fight with a thorny bush in Cloakwood Forest. And that dialogue will add a quest automatically to your journal. And then at some point, you'll be walking along, singing a song, and thereby you wander into Yon Troll. And you try to place your sword in the same space as the monster's stomach. And while you cook hot dogs over its corpse, a quest update will remind you of a quest you didn't know you had, and a mission you didn't even realize you were on will autocomplete. Isn't that fun? Doesn't that sound like fun to you? I'm pretty sure Bioware was aware of this, and one of the things they changed in BG2 was the side quests. They made them into large, self-contained areas, not unlike a dungeon master creating a one-shot campaign. The quests are purposeful because they're a means to get to the end of the game. You have to do at least some of them in order to get enough money to charter a ship to save your sister, but you get to choose which quests you do and which ones you don't, up to a certain point, that is. I mean, you also get to choose which quests you do in BG1, but I normally just choose to not do them at all because they aren't very 
satisfying. Only the main quests have the meat that I'm looking for. And some of these side quests are just trash for low level characters to get killed. And these fetch and kill quests, go here, kill this, grab this while you're there and come back. And when you get there, you're trapped in a room full of spiders at level one, because of course you're level one. If you've been wandering around and killing things, well, good for you, but you're still likely level one. And that's because leveling in this game is crazy slow. Everything picks up once you get to Nashkel and begin the investigation of the mines, and you want to do this early in order to keep your weapons from breaking. Now, regardless of what you think about this mechanic, or ticking clocks in general, I think that they could be a good thing. I'm not one of these type of people who just, like, dismisses a design methodology just because I don't like its specific implementation in a specific game. I can always see how a ticking clock like this could work in a game, right? The, the ticking clock is like this. If you screw around in the open world a little too much, What's going to end up happening are the weapons that you use that are metal, they're going to break. And it's actually for story reasons because these guys are poisoning the ore that's coming out of these mines, right? So any weapons that are made with that metal are going to end up disintegrating basically in your hands. It does, it forces you without forcing you to investigate the main quest as quickly as possible, right? Because you could get away with not doing that. Like magical weapons like Varscona, stuff like that, they're not gonna disintegrate. But regular ass weapons, they will disintegrate. So it kind of puts you in this mood of like, well, I'm tired of replacing my weapons every time I get to a new town, so screw this. I'm gonna go investigate what's going on at the mine. It's a way to force the player to do the thing that you want without actually forcing them to do it. You still give them an opportunity to do something else, but you sort of punish them a little bit for doing that. And I kind of like it. And there is one version of a ticking clock that I'm none too fond of, and a lot of gamers are not very fond of. And I think I might actually agree with them on this. And that's the type of ticking clock where if you reach the end of the timer, you die. Game over, sorry, you lose. Yeah, I don't like those too much. I did like it in Fallout though. So like I said, there's always at least one implementation of these kinds of mechanics that actually works. So I don't dismiss a game just because there's a mechanic in it I don't like. I try to give it a chance first before I dismiss it completely. Nashkel is supposed to be the northernmost city in Am, but it's also supposed to be the coldest, but I don't think the game knows that because it don't look that way. Am and Baldur's Gate have been having some issues lately, but to understand any of that, we gotta understand something about Am first. Am is a country that benefits greatly from its use of slave labor and mostly a slave militia. This use of slavery as a tool has always been a source of tension between the two countries. Am is a big place, not a very accepting place either, being that it's mostly human and not too keen on non-humans. Am is a place of trade, often working with the Zentarum or the Black Network as they are known by rivals, to ensure that trade deals go off without a hitch. It's also a very top-heavy society, meaning they like money. They like it a lot. It's the reason they get out of bed in the morning, so they can watch the line go up. And since they often deal with the Zentarum, Baldur's Gate would be none too keen on trusting them, because if the Zen are known for anything, it's betrayal. They're simultaneously the best people for the job and the worst people for the job, because if you hire them to take over some land, for example, chances are they'll do that, and they'll keep the land and ransom it out to the people that hired them to take it back in the first place. So you have a situation where the iron coming out of Am, which Baldur's Gate is paying for, is faulty, brittle, and tensions between the two cities are already high. Add this iron shortage and it'll start to look like Am is trying to destroy Baldur's Gate's military before they sack them. And quite a few NPCs will mention this, usually offhanded remarks about tension between the two cities, but again, the geopolitics of the region aren't often mentioned, and to me, it's a big blemish on the game. I write quite a few forum posts where people were confused as to why there was tension with Am and Baldur's Gate in the first place, and I understand their confusion. It's not mentioned much, and the only depth you typically get in a playthrough is learning why these tensions are being amplified but not what caused these tensions in the first place. Because it isn't just the ore shortage, there are interesting historical reasons that are likely delivered in some book in the game that I didn't read because, quite frankly, that's not why I play video games. Minsk is a ranger that you'll likely meet standing out in the middle of nowhere, staring up at the clouds, or watching children play in Ashkel. He has brain damage from taking one too many shots to the head, and Boo is his miniature giant space hamster. This guy is probably the dude that is most associated with Dungeons and Dragons. I bought this card game called Monster Madness from Wizards and Minsk is one of the characters you can play as. He has endured, not because he's a deep character with a complex background, 
but because he's goofy as shit. And nobody knows why he is the way he is, so it creates this intrigue about him. He's so popular that he's one of the characters that made it into the sequel. Khalid, on the other hand, uh, not so much. Boo makes a return as well, and it's intimated that Minsk was able to sneak the hamster into the prison using what a fashion designer friend of mine used to call nature's pocket. Now your characters have three quick slots that they can use to equip items that they need to use right away, like potions, spell scrolls, wands, things like that, right? Well, Minsk only has two, because one of them always has his little hamster in it, right? And if you try to remove him, he gives you one of these. <coughs> ah, yeah, that's nice. Give me another one of those. <coughs> Give me another. <coughs> Give me one more. <coughs> I could click this little motherfucker all day. I actually came through to Nashkel twice. The first time I came through, I found out that at some point, somewhere along my journey, I must have killed an innocent person because my reputation went down so far that Minsk was like, I'm not joining you, get away from me. It was like he could smell the evil on me. So I had to go back, redo all this stuff. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about. The way they handled reputation in this game, it's like super simple, but it really works. Like it really works to make you feel like people have heard of you and know what you're all about for better or worse, right? Like if you make an ass of things everywhere that you go and you leave a trail of dead bodies in your wake and people are going to acknowledge that about you. And I like that. It's a simple, but very elegant system that works really well. In this town is a monk, and he does monk stuff. And since the original game didn't have a monk class, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say he's a new character. I didn't use him, because why would I? I mean, I pretty much always use the same team. The routine is probably the only thing that keeps me sane. I don't think the new stuff is all that bad, to be honest. It still doesn't feel like it fits, however. I mean, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's probably the voice acting. Thank you for asking. My name is Rasad. She would never consort with a half-orc, especially when she has me. <laughs> okay. There's just something really special about that original cast, seeing as how many of them are absolute fucking legends in the industry. There's an assassin, of course, in the first bar we go to, and of course this bitch is a way higher level than we are, and good luck hitting her because she's armored, and she's able to get off a charm and two hold person spells before we get a hit in. And after three tries, we eventually get lucky and kill her almost immediately before she's even able to get off a single spell. This is the randomness that I was talking about. It's truly random. It's not very fun to sit and watch your characters miss each other for five minutes only to die at the end. But I'm gonna be honest and say this straight out. This is probably the best that turn-based combat has probably ever felt to me. I know that may seem shocking given the difficulty curve at the beginning of the game, but I assure you, I'm not jerking you around. Once you get used to the combat, it feels really good. And I think a lot of that is down to the fact that this combat can take a while. The fact that enemies don't hit as often, and you don't as well, means you have some time to think about your characters while they're slugging it out, and you might come up with something special that might change the tide of the fight while watching them swing and miss, but mostly it's to avoid getting jibbed in a single round, because that can and does happen in this game, and not as much as a lot of YouTubers would like you to believe. The fact of the matter is, the game gives you about a million ways to make this combat easier. In fact, I'm going to show you one right now. Do you remember the friendly arm in? Remember how I said there was nothing there? Well, there is. It's a ring. It's called Ever Memory. What it does is double your first level spell slot capacity. Yeah, that's right, you heard me. You get double the spells. That means my little fighter mage here goes from being a liability to my main tank without even wearing armor because he can cast armor and shield or he could sell the ring for 9,000 gold and outfit all your party members with the best gear you can find at this level. The game knows it's hard and it's hoping that you'll explore the maps thoroughly to find the great stuff they've strewn about the game. A lot of games will weight the roles to succeed more often so that the flow of combat is a little less tedious, and this game, for better or worse, was like, yeah, fuck that. If you don't want to get bored for long stretches of time, you shouldn't be playing Dungeons and Dragons. While in Nashville, you're going to want to talk to the main man in charge here. He tells us that the iron shortage is coming from this mine directly. That not only is his ore being tainted, but his miners are going missing. Missing, you say? Well, that's odd, you might be thinking. Better go and investigate. Now, I love the way that this story unfolds from like a structure standpoint because this game lets you skip all of this. To be honest, up to this point, you don't have to follow a single breadcrumb that's left for you. But if you wanted to, the game had a structure that would give you a goal to achieve and let you achieve it when you felt like it, to a point. Before you left Candlekeep, your dad tells you that if he should croak, that you need to go find his friends at the Friendly Arm Inn. 
It shows it on your map and you instinctually go in the direction that will lead you to the inn. While traveling, you'll likely run across some companions along the way. And I don't know what they had planned for this, but these two guys, plus these two guys, that's like eating salt while drinking water. These two dudes are Zents, and these two lifelong lovers are Harpers, and boy oh boy, do these two groups hate each other. But you don't know, as a player, that these guys are Zentarum. But the Harpers make no secret of their affiliation, so it's jarring to the player why these two groups will bicker with one another until they learn about their affiliations, then it becomes a little clearer. Then you're told by Jahira that your next goal is to get the Nashkel, and along the way, new missions open up. You gather more info on what is going on, and when you get the Nashkel, the mystery deepens when you find out that people are going missing from within the mine. The mine is the source of everything wrong, so you'll naturally want to find out what is wrong. Or if you have no idea what's happening, you would be told where to go by other characters enough during your journey that the problem would sort itself out. I've always liked that about this game, but this sort of hand-holding almost completely disappears near the end, but we'll get to that soon. But let's say that none of that worked because you avoided the story as much as you could. Well, there's other ways to get information out of people besides murder. Some of the spells in this game have utility beyond combat, the best example being Charm, which can be used to get major characters in the game to talk to you and spill their darkest secrets. And there's this guy, Grey Wolf, and you're probably gonna have to fight him later on if you're a good guy, you know, if you're a stand-up dude, but if you charm him, ah, he just becomes your best friend. Greatest pal, best buds forever. And there's a ton of other special dialogues in the game that are only accessed when you charm certain NPCs. One of the more lengthy ones is the one with the Spider Queen Sentiol, who actually alludes to John Irenicus, the antagonist of the sequel to Baldur's Gate. If you charm Jar, he'll actually tell you about his hidden mission, and the order that he belongs to, the Order of Zentarum. You've probably heard me say this name for a while and you're probably like, who the hell are these people? Well, the Zentarum is an evil faction who work in service to the dark quasi-deity Bane and Cyric, and their overall goal is domination and power. By allowing charm to be used in this way, the game allows you to force a character to tell you about themselves with the simple use of a mechanic that the player may be thinking only has combat uses, but it went the extra step to make it provide out of combat benefits as well. I love it when games find a way to utilize one mechanic in multiple ways. It adds a ton of depth on the cheap. Detect Evil is another spell that it sounds useless, but on your first time through this game, very helpful for determining the motives of people that you're talking to, and has come in handy when trying to determine if I'm about to save a screaming woman or if I'm walking into an ambush. Oddly enough, some of these mechanics were just straight up dropped in BG2. In fact, some have said that the alignments of NPCs are messed up and cause a lot of false positives when you're using the skill. So that's sad, but it's something that this game did much better than any of its predecessors, and some of the games that have been released after. Like, this is a thing that should be a design trope by now, I think, in my opinion. I mean, it should be like, if there's a toilet in a first-person action game, you have to be able to flush it. Charm has to give special dialogue to NPCs who are important, okay? That should become a trope. This is, this is RPG's toilet flushing. When we meet Minsk for the first time, he's pretty straightforward with what he wants. He says that we should let him pass, but when we found him, he was just standing around looking in the sky, probably staring directly into the sun, because this dude talks to a tiny hamster. Like, how many hamsters do you think that this guy went through? My internal canon is that previous to meeting us, there was this guy that used to follow him around and make sure he stayed out of trouble. But Lenny here kept hugging the hamsters too tight while sleeping, and this dude would just replace them to keep Minsk from getting upset. But one day, I guess Minsk figured out the whole thing and started strangling this dude in his sleep in a moment of brain-damaged rage. And this Dina hair chick, well, this dude's been following her around ever since, and she got herself kidnapped by the gnolls to get away from him. And it all worked until we showed up to set her free. Is any of this in the game? No. Not much is really in the game about these two, but like I said, that's part of the charm of this game. Back when my imagination was fully intact and the system of monetary exchange had morphed my love of creating shit into a means to an end, I used to love how thin the writing was, because it gave me opportunities to create backstories for these characters in lieu of something more concrete. 
But now that my imagination is ruined, I kind of wish they had more time to tell their story. This place has always been a little weird to me. There's these areas where dogmen spawn, and they can sometimes spawn in right behind you while you're engaged in fights with other dogmen, and this place feels super underdeveloped, like, yeah, there's a ton of dogmen, must be a base of some sorts, but uh, where do they sleep? Where do they eat? Where do they tell their kids to shut up and take a seat? Where do they live, is what I mean. There's no indoor areas to explore. There's no hive of these assholes to invade and destroy or drive them out. They just keep spawning out of thin air. And this is supposed to give you this feeling that you're invading a base and everything is in chaos, but all it really does is just be a pain in the ass. In fact, you could just keep jerking Minsk around by getting him killed now and then and resetting his quest timer because once you have jerked him around enough, he'll get super pissed off and try to kill you and everyone in the group as if you reminded him that Boo was not his original hamster. And that's something we could talk about. Your companions react in a way that is both hard to predict and yet within character. If you jerk some of these guys around, they'll go berserk, or they just straight up leave in the middle of the night, leaving you only a note. Those dynamics are interesting to me because I don't think I've seen too many games after this ever try this again. The industry seems to be afraid to make the player responsible for anything they do. So at least in my experience, this is a relatively unique thing that this game did on top of all the other shit it did. I mean, the fact that your characters in the course of traveling one another will start bickering and fighting over every little thing until, if you let it continue, your party members split up into two groups and start stabbing each other until one side remains, effectively destroying half of your team. Oh, wait a minute. Fuck, that's probably why they don't do that anymore. Now, remember how before I was saying that this game doesn't really have any good side content? Well, now that I've played more of it, my memory is starting to make an ass out of past me while future me tells you about how this game can deliver an impactful quest without much effort just because they avoided gamifying the outcome of every quest and instead chose to focus on simple designs that convey a preset story. This is best summed up in the quest to save a farmer's child from an egg nest. The farmer is distraught, you see. It's just him and his kid out here alone. Without that kid, well, the farmer's not going to be able to tend to his house and his farm no more, so he implores us, even though he has nothing to give us, to find it in our heart to look for his missing son. And while I'm down in the nest, grinding out some EXP on these insect-looking-ass prairie dogs, I find this little cubby hole and... Oh no... It's a dead kid. They killed the kid. The developers, not the monsters. I mean, I guess they both did. Normally a quest like this would give you the opportunity to save the kid or feed the kid to the monsters, but that's so black and white that it's uninteresting. But rarely does a game have the balls to make the player not feel like a hero. Instead, you take the body back to the father, and not only did this farmer lose his kid today, but he also lost his livelihood. It's a bold choice, making the player feel useless and all. But I liked it, because sometimes, no matter how hard or heroically you fight, you're going to be too late to do anything about it. And you can beat yourself up about it, or you could be grateful that anything in this random ass existence goes right for you while it's all going wrong for someone else out there. In other words, the farmer makes me feel better about my life. I guess I like these quests the most about this game because Baldur's Gate 1 had that special kind of goofiness that came from playing D&D with good friends. There's a talking chicken quest where you find out that the talking chicken is a thief who was training with a wizard and got impatient and stole a pair of cursed bracers, or the mission where you find a strange idol in the dwelling of an ancient civilization and are attacked by an avenging spirit right after you found a cursed two-handed sword in the hands of a man you killed because you couldn't figure out the riddle. And mistakes like that aren't punished. They actually want you to make the mistake and see the outcome of that mistake because they aren't punished, which makes it easier for the player to accept the outcome of any given quest without reloading a save game. Nashkale Mines is the place that, if I get here, I usually stop here. But oddly enough, this is where the game actually picks up. First, there's a cool little mission involving a bounty hunter and a sculptor. The sculptor stole two emeralds to place in the eyes of a sculpture he made of a woman that he only saw in passing and fell in love with. He laments that he lost his one and only chance to be with her because he was a coward. He risked his life, knowing Grey Wolf would eventually kill him just so he could see her face once more in the edifice of rock before he died so he could recognize her in the afterlife. Now that's a pretty fucking good premise, right? 
But Grey Wolf doesn't give two shits and a sun hat about any of that. This is just the payday for him. Now, if you kill Grey Wolf to protect the sculptor, you'll not only get the gemstones he used his eyes in the sculpture, but you'll get Varscona, an insane plus two longsword at level one. And you want this weapon, trust me. But this guy's pretty strong. I remember having a hard time with him in previous playthroughs because I was always level one or two by the time I met the guy. But there is a solution in this very same area, a wand of ice. And this highlights two things that this game did that, again, I haven't seen many other games do. If you use the wand on him to kill him, and his HP goes below minus 15, you'll jib the enemy and his parts go bouncing around the level. If you hit that person with ice, then he's shattered. And this will also shatter any equipment that character has on him. When you find this out for the first time, you're gonna be pissed off, but this is just another thing that the game makes you think about, right? The more simulation aspect of things. Use a disintegration spell on an enemy and watch them turn to dust along with all their shit. So we head over to the mine, ask for permission to enter, and the fun begins. At this point, I've had people die on me twice. Trust me, at level one, two, and even three, this is gonna happen. And it's gonna happen often. And every time it does, you'll hate your life, either that or you'll reload a save. I'm not gonna blame you if you reloaded a save either, because why wouldn't you? It's annoying as fuck to lose your tank in the middle of the first floor dungeon to a one-shot crit arrow. It's either walk all the way back topside, and then all the way back to town, or reload, and I know which one's easier. At this point, you might be wondering why you would put up with death at all. Why not just disable it? Well, you know, it's kind of funny that you said that, because a lot of games that came after this one did that. If you fell in battle, you don't actually die, or in some cases, you actually come back to life after the fight's over. This is a convenience thing, but I like it when it's an optional thing. But when death isn't optional, it gives you some interesting gameplay options to consider. Ones that you, the player, create to make a game harder or easier. But really, when you think about it, you're making gameplay design decisions when you do this. This is basically a fancy way of saying, modify the rules to be more fun. And the game allows you to do that in way more ways than's obvious at first. Because this game is one of those rare games that has a console command line. You could open up the console and give yourself a rod of resurrection at the beginning of the game and limit yourself to one per turn, or you could treat the shit like a phoenix down and raise everyone from the dead, even in the middle of a fight, and just keep recharging the thing with your infinite supply of money. Or if you don't have access to a command line, you could set your own rules, right? Like, uh, whenever you enter in a dungeon, you're only allowed one save, and if you want to reload, you have to start at the beginning of the dungeon. That's what I did this time around, and I really liked it. It made the game feel more intense and gave me a reason to struggle with the stupid fucking stealth mechanics to have you standing in one place for five minutes waiting for your character to succeed at a stealth roll. You gotta love that randomness. But what I'm really saying is this, game developers need to bring back the command line because the command line allowed players the ability to set their own difficulty. And if you look at the ratio of all time greatest games versus how many had a command line, I, I'm, I'm betting you it's almost like 90%. I actually have no idea what the percentage is. I just pulled that number out of my ass, but it feels right. Command lines offer freedom to the player. The best command line like system a game ever had was the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, that game. It allowed you to like put pieces of the level down wherever you wanted. And if you wanted to reach a part of the level that was inaccessible, you just created a new ledge. Or you created a bunch of power-ups to make you invincible. But these tools also essentially allowed you to make your own level within the level. All of this was done with button combinations. Baldur's Gate allows you to set your own difficulty, adjust your stats, give yourself golden items, or you could create your own custom encounters with monsters that you choose. It's a fantastic tool. And the great thing is, almost every game I've worked on had a command line, no matter the studio, even on Xbox and PlayStation, so it'd be a simple matter to separate it from debug and make it a feature. So game studios, release the console commands. You give your games more longevity when you do this. And if you're not gonna release a console command line, then at least take notes from Alcat's awesome difficulty settings in Wrath of the Righteous, which, who wants a Wrath of the Righteous video this year? 
Last video was a review and it was at a time when the game was broken, just let me know below. That difficulty screen is basically a mod screen. You have so many options that drastically affect gameplay that it legit makes the game feel different with different combinations of settings. One of the best difficulty select screens I've ever seen. Now the mines are where the game starts to become a lot of fun. See, this is a dungeon. <gasps> just like the title of the game. And this is a really good dungeon. The first two levels are like foreplay. You run into some kobolds, you kill them easily, and you move on. But the third floor is where shit gets real. And it's probably the first time that you're gonna run into a trap. Well, hopefully you disarm it instead of running into it, but because of RNG, <laughs> there's no really telling, you know what I mean? It's, it's really about fate and whatnot. And if you have bad luck normally with games that have RNG elements in it, well, guess what? This game? can make it worse. This dungeon is a prime example of me really liking something that everyone else hates. Traps are a mixed bag for me. In fact, I think this is probably the first time I had seen traps done this way in a video game. Now, the way it works is you have one character in your group who can usually detect traps. And that detection is based off of a percentage chance that you'll fail or succeed. And there's a very good chance that at level one, you will fail to detect nearly every single trap on this floor. Thankfully, the traps aren't too deadly, but later on, <laughs> oh boy, watch your ass, cousin. But like I said, I got mixed feelings on this, right? Baldur's Gate 3, in my opinion, as of early access, that is, handled traps in the ideal way, right? Traps are events, not just obstacles. In tabletop, you might run into a trap and the goal might be to not trigger it, or perhaps you've already triggered it, but now the goal is to stop it before it kills your entire party. Baldur's Gate 1, on the other hand, treats traps like claymores. They're there to fuck your day up and make you reload, which isn't very satisfying and steps its foot over that line of inconvenience to frustration. Like you. Bitch with the hood, your one and only job right now is to find the fucking traps. Find them! Again, pure randomness, just playing havoc. Sometimes you go through this area and find every trap, score nothing but critical hits, and blow through this place like you own it. And other times you're quick saving every couple of feet, paranoid that you're about to trigger another ball bearing bomb. <laughs> you're a queer fellow. Oh! Bitch, are you trying to get me swatted? There's another use for thieves, and that's scouting out locations, and this is especially helpful in caves, but I don't know how to tell you this. Hiding is all determined on that awesome and oh-so-unpredictable variable of random chance, which once again will have you sitting here watching your character fail to go into stealth for 12 straight minutes. This caused younger me to say screw this and never use stealth for anything. I basically would go through an area, quick saving, stumbling into fights as haphazardly as you please, and memorize their fights, their locations. And I would do this thing that I used to do in tabletop games where you open the door to a room while a mage is casting a spell and then close it after it goes off. And surprisingly, you can basically do that in this game. And ambushing with spells, Mm, mwah, super good, but scouting with a thief, big old poo filled diaper, I, I, I hate it. There's a ton of these kobolds down here and I'm not sure, but I think the game will sometimes spawn even more in due to, <laughs> you guessed it, a random chance. But a sleep spell makes quick work of these dudes, so I can always just run in, get Sheldor to cast sleep, and take care of these guys not taking a nap first, then clean up the rest. And I gotta tell you, the spells in this game are satisfying as hell to get off because it requires timing and spatial recognition to pull off a lot of fights. Like fireballs, since there's no indication of how big that explosion is, you'll eventually start being able to eyeball the distance and radius of spells and getting the timing of them off before the enemy can close distance. It feels really great, but not when you're starting out. Shit feels bad, real bad. And that's when you just have to get up, you know, go to the bathroom, write the word slut on your forehead and slap yourself in the face real hard, like hard enough to see a handprint, then take a picture of it and post it on my Twitter. When you come back, Baldur's Gate 3 will have downloaded and you can play that instead. The way these dungeons were sorted in the original Baldur's Gate was nice. It always felt like you were exploring an expansive dungeon like you would in pen and paper. Lots of winding tunnels and surprising encounters, terminating each path to a dead end. This encounter here is where most people will be handed an L for their effort. 
What we have is a narrow tunnel that leads to a bridge. And what is that bridge carving a path over? That's right, lava. You've got three little body blockers right here on this side of the bridge, and on the other side, just some more kobolds, but these guys have magic arrows that will end your career if you don't do something about them right now. But if you charge the bridge with your melee fellas, you'll leave your back line open. But guess what works right every time? Luring them out and killing them just out of line of sight of the kobold shooting you on the other side of the bridge because they won't move from their positions. In fact, if you had access to a nice little AoE spell, you could just throw one right into the middle of that bridge and the cute little dudes will get annihilated. Eventually you'll make it to an island in the middle of the underground lake. Inside are one million kobolds, some nice ornamental rugs, and a goth kid looking for his skinny puppy t-shirt. In the southern room with all the rugs is a mentally defective Cyric follower who thinks that we were sent by his boss to kill him, instead of the much more logical conclusion which would be to assume that we were the local militia or some mercenary sent to investigate the mine. I mean, your base operation is literally inside the same cave as the ore you're poisoning, okay? This dude's not exactly easy to kill. Sometimes he'll summon a bunch of kobolds and skellies to fight you and sleep won't work on the skellies because they're dead. They don't eat sleep. My only hope was to keep hacking away at them, and I hope he died before he could get off the spell and it worked. But then we had to kill another 20 or so minions, so yeah, but we did it, and only lost two people. And every time you kill, you'll find new items, and each new item is significant, like even if it only says it affects your missile defense, well, that's still good, because an AC of minus six against arrows means you could survive fights like the one at the bridge before, and that ice staff is there specifically to help you kill Grey Wolf. If you explore and utilize an effective strategy, the game will let you walk right through it. It'll even hold the door open for you. So people who say that this game is too hard, yeah, I don't know about that. The game gives you basically everything you need to survive it, you just need to actually use what it gives you. From gloves to potions to scrolls, there's a ton of utility and ways around any given challenge. That is what's so compelling about this game. On Mullahay's corpse, you'll find a letter that says an associate of his, Transig, will be at the inn in Baragost waiting Mullahay's reply. And if you go back to Baragost, you'll meet this fella, stab him in the guts, and on his corpse is another letter that tells you to go to the woods and meet up with another guy. But don't go there at night because behind every bush you'll find dudes getting their fuck on. It becomes a real sausage fest. Oh, and a uh, hot fact, your local park is likely your best shot at getting a blowjob late night. Keep that fact right up here in your noggin for later. You never know what you might be in the mood for at 2 a.m. on a Friday, am I right? Then, once you're done with the imagery that I've put in your head and you've closed all the incognito tab rabbit holes that I've sent you on, you'll exit through the back of the mine. You'll die because you got ambushed by a group of assholes who were hunting you because they... They don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming. As you proceed through the game, you'll have some dreams. The voice of your father becomes more distinct as he tried to do a 500th trimester abortion on your ass with a bone dagger. With every kill you make, you feed his influence within you. Having his blood means that he lives on within you in some way. And it's not until the second game that we get to see what form that takes. This is the high reputation dream sequence which shows you sparing Malahay, but if you were a bad guy doing bad things, you'd get a slightly different dream. You choke that asshole to death with your bare hands, and instead of getting a healing spell, you get a healing spell and a damaging spell with Larlock's Minor Drain. Each dream sequence tells you about your character. Are you going down the path of resistance or the path of compliance? Will you become your father or stand apart from him? It's one of the ways that the game sets itself apart from all other games that came after it. There's a level of care in the things that the game was able to do, which newer games just don't even try to do a whole lot. Like, like I'm sorry, but it really is the small things that you do to make things believable that go a long way to making me love the world you've built. Like, imagine if there was just one type of dream you could have no matter what kind of character you were. That would feel quite limiting, wouldn't it? Like the game wasn't taking your own choices into account. You wouldn't be able to show the character's personality or beliefs or anything at, at all interesting about the protagonist, but with this, it feels like the game knows and is acknowledging the kind of character we're role-playing, and that helps me get into the role. So anyway, you go out into the woods in search of dudes and find a whole group of them in the middle of a clearing. If you say the wrong thing, you'll end up killing everyone, and then you'll need to seek out the other group in the other part of the woods, 
and if you wind up killing them, you'll finally be able to enter their forest camp of the bandits who are essentially three clans of humanoids who have been hired by the Iron Throne. But if you sweet talk them, they'll take you to their boss, but you have to fight to prove that you could be a member of their little club? You could spend time here, talk to the various groups, but the more time you spend here, the more likely you are to get exposed. Now what about this Iron Throne we keep hearing about? All these bandits keep talking about them. People in the Sword Coast are all pretty sure this group is behind the poisoning of the mines or so. What's up with these guys? Well, they're a merchant group that mainly have to hire intermediaries in business deals because everyone hates them and no one wants to be associated with them. Their plan is fairly simple. Eliminate the competition and install yourself as a monopoly. To do this, they started poisoning the ore coming out of the mine and the weapons forged with it become frail and brittle and break down. With an iron shortage in full effect, the economy would start to collapse. No iron means no nails for constructing new homes, no replacement tools for farmers to grow and harvest food. And if the supply chain becomes disrupted, well, you already know what happens then. The Iron Throne are betting that once the iron is gone and there's no longer any faith in the iron coming out of Nashkel, that the Iron Throne will open up the doors of their secret iron mine and step in as the hero, amending their terrible reputation and stabilizing the currently tense situation between Baldur's Gate and Om. But what does that have to do with the Big Iron Man in the intro? Well, we'll get to that soon. Well, I, I don't know about soon. I I I've been known to talk a, a lot, so anyway. So you'll have to fight Tezok, and this guy's a real vibe check for me, because not only was he the first time I died in this run, but I died not once, not twice, not even three times, but four times, before I went to grind out Ankhegs to get myself closer to a level that was more in line with my companions. And when I went back, I was disappointed to find out that I still couldn't kill him, because he bitches out at the end. At the end of the fight, he's like, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're, oh, yeah, you're pretty good, kid. I'm gonna go lie down. Now, inside the tent are all three of the leaders for this group, and you can actually kill them all pretty easily. The thing is, there's an innocent bystander in here, and my usual method of sneaking into a room and like nuking people with fireballs, it doesn't really work here unless I want to lose a lot of reputation. So, uh, I did it this way. You guys give up? Yeah, that's right. You can fool the AI by just, you know, playing that little game where you run around the other side of the table and then they come after you and you run to the other side. <laughs> it's pretty nice, I gotta admit. Now inside this room is a trapped chest and that trapped chest is gonna have a bunch of letters that these guys write back and forth to each other. And honestly, I wouldn't have discovered any of this shit if these guys weren't so dedicated to keeping each other's letters and shit. You know, this is one of those situations where you really do need to burn after reading. So anyway, these assholes are writing down their darkest secrets on paper so that I can find it. And uh, there's another guy in here, his name is Ender Sai, and he's gonna tell you everything that you need to know about these guys. So normally this guy thinks you're there to execute him, right? And Normally he'd be right because I didn't even know he was in there when I started throwing fireballs and yeah, that's a sure enough execution, all right. And basically this guy confirms all of our worst suspicions about the Iron Throne. See, he says that he's from the city and he likes to know whose feet he's stepping on and he knows for a fact that he's never stepped on any Zenterum feet. The only feet that he's been stepping on are the Iron Throne and right as rain, here he is, sitting as a prisoner waiting for execution because he fucked with the wrong people. After every major adventure that ends in a big blowout fight, you'll likely go back to town, restock on projectiles, replace weapons, buy new gear, and resurrect any dead companions you might get. And I like it when games require this kind of thing, because while I was in Baragost, I finished a few side quests that I was a little underpowered to do at first, like the spider mission. And because I was riding high on a hog, I decided to do some cleanup on assassins who were waiting for me, and to pick up some potions. Now, the potions in 2nd edition were really good. <laughs> they were expensive, to be sure. But tell me if this sounds worth buying. A 0 AC and a minus 5 on all saves for like, a long friggin' time. Hours even. Invisibility potions. Potions you throw to act like a fireball spell. Potions 
Potions that turn your skin to wood accompanied by potions that turn your skin to iron. A potion that gives you a 25 in strength. I mean, damn, if there's a spell for it, there's an alchemical equivalent. Then there's the wands, which damn man these things have got me out of a heap of trouble so if you find them use them i don't think younger me appreciated just how strong these potions and wands were i'm telling you all of this because i needed to prepare for a very long and at times tedious adventure there are several maps dedicated to just traversing cloakwood and they are jam-packed with all sorts of monsters that you don't want to be dealing with. Every sadistic, awful thing that the tabletop designers could think of to scare the bejesus out of a player and make them fear for their character's life, they're in here. We have large spiders, which are about two feet long. Okay, right now, just imagine this, but two feet long, the size of a regular ass dog. Then we have giant spiders, and those things are just, they're eight to 12 feet long, all right? But it gets worse. There's spiders that can teleport. That's right. Imagine seeing a black widow on a countertop and you take off your shoe to try and smash it, but then you lift your shoe up and there's nothing there because the spider has teleported behind you. The call is coming from in the house. Now those teleporting assholes, yeah, they're only 14 feet long. You know, decent size. Then there's the sword spiders and these guys, they're just 12 feet long, just 12 feet, but they have swords for limbs and are constantly hasted so they can attack like four times for every one of your attacks. Which makes sense, right? Because you've seen how fast these little fuckers can move when you miss them with the newspaper. I am a speciest, okay? If you got more than four legs, I'm not fucking with you. I don't give a shit if you're a ladybug or not. And to make it worse, those sword legs, they do 2d12 damage. On top of every other reason that spiders suck, here's another one. They poison you as well. Isn't that nice? And if they just so happen to poison the person who has a spell of slow poison, they can't use it because every tick of health it damages interrupts your spell casting. Isn't that awesome? That sounds like a whole lot of fun, don't it? But listen, kid, this isn't the shit I wanted to talk to you about. Because the spiders are fine. It's cool, bro. You just have to find a way to deal with them. Fireworks. Burn them with fire. What is not cool is the fact that these assholes know how to set up web traps. <laughs> Boy, web is such a fun spell. Here's what this nonsense does. It shoots out webs in a huge AOE. And if you get stuck in them, you get immobilized and cannot attack or move. It's fun, you'll see. It happens so much that you'll be sick and tired of this spell until you get to use it on enemies, then it's, then it's completely amazing, it's fine. The issue I have with this shit is that it lasts way too long, and like every spell with a duration like Entangle, it lasts beyond battle. It's rather inconvenient when it also won't let you rest because it's off in the corner freaking out, making noises loud enough so that you'll pay attention to it. <laughs> Then you'll run across this spider lady, and you know what she has? A bunch of spiders, sorty boys, oh uh, yeah, a few nightmare-inducing edder caps for good measure. But if you kill her, you get to find another dead kid. Yay! The Secret Mine is the final area in this series of areas known as Cloakwood, and it is very forgettable. Now, I'm saying that because it's only been maybe two or three days since I beat the game, and I can't remember a single thing about this area. Granted, I hadn't played this game in years, but I still remembered this game so well that I had all the spawn locations of difficult enemies memorized up until now. This place is a complete mystery to me. I ended up having to watch my footage just to remind myself of what I did. Now you might be looking at what I'm about to do here and you might think to yourself, why is he playing the game this way? It doesn't look fun to play that way because <laughs> if you cheat the game, you're really only cheating yourself. But here's the thing, when I enter into a fight and I only see two guys in armor, I'm thinking, hell yeah, I can kill these guys easy enough. But then the fight starts and I find out they got mages and those mages are already buffed and casting spells at me. If I got room to do it, you better bet I'm going to hightail out of that bitch before I die. The problem is, these guys, the mages, they're told to stay put. You stand right here and don't move. If anything comes at you, stay where you are. If someone runs away, stay where you are. Don't pursue. So, like, look, it's not my fault. It's the AI is too dumb to move from their positions and will just allow me to kite the armor guys away from the magic. So, take them across the bridge while the mages stand there, way off in a distance, watching, wondering if they should do something. Then, they also stand there as I nap just over the bridge. And I gotta say, 
The dedication on these guys is amazing because they stood there, watched the entire night, and waited until we got rested, and even waited for us to cast our spells, which sucked and failed in every way. And even better, because you don't whip out the murder guns right away, my archers just suck all your life away. The AI in this game is both good and bad at the same time. Like, it's super easy to fool this game into doing something stupid and getting itself killed. I mean, it's fun, don't get me wrong. And younger me, when I played this game for the first time, man, those mages gave me a hard time. But after I learned their one weakness, which is apparently walking any small amount, they cease to be difficult. And that, well, now that you know this, they'll never challenge you again. I guess I kind of, you know, ruined the game for you. Sorry about that. Off one of the corpses, I managed to find a really nice pair of boots, which give me hasted movement, which this is basically when you become a friggin' god. I don't do this this time around, but if you're careful, you could basically solo the game with detonation arrows and these boots. You just run strafing maneuvers and bombard people with arrows that explode like fireballs. It's real dumb. The thing that I remember the most about the dungeons in this game is that they're rudimentary. It puts on a big show with that first dungeon, but there's hardly any dungeons in this game called Dungeons and Dragons, and to top it all off, there's not a single dragon. Not one. And the dungeons that the game does have are pretty basic. I like it, but they don't lead anywhere, they just terminate in dead ends. So you just keep going down these tunnels until you find the one that leads you to the next floor. The most that this game could muster up that's unique in this place is this dwarven water lock over here that is signposted as being something that you need to open and flood the mine with later on, but you can't interact with it right now, and most of the NPCs here don't really have much interesting to say about these situations. I mean, these dungeons are pretty anemic. There's this great skeleton of a system here, and we put a shirt on it and some pants and a nice hat, but we forgot the friggin' skin. It's easy to forget that this game was like a proof of concept, at best, of what CRPGs could be in the modern era of games. I mean, it's easy to overlook, but the spells in this game, there's so many, and each one affects how the AI behaves. It's a great spell simulation. There's just so much to get excited about. You might look at this list right now and not be impressed, but trust me, this game has set the bar really high, and you could look at it this way. If they hadn't proved that this style of game could be profitable, would any of the companies that came after it have even tried something so risky? I mean, look at the industry. The AAA market is scared to death of its own fucking shadow. Then we come to this place, and this place is as basic as it comes. You got these guards who we blow through faster than a fart through a wet napkin, and you got some secret doors that lead to a prison and a possible companion, and this guy tells us that his poor unfortunate ass told the Iron Throne about these mines and they took him prisoner for his efforts. How rude. Down here are some potentially difficult fights, but they're not really. You fight these people in rooms that have doors and hallways which can be retreated into, so if a mage casts a spell and you run out of the door, and his confusion spell manages to hit you anyway, at least you'll be freaking out in the hallway where the mage can't get to you. But the final fight is kind of interesting. He has this mechanic where he'll teleport himself whenever you get close to get a hit in to another room in that floor of the dungeon, but he was too busy teleporting to do anything about the arrows that were puncturing his kidneys, liver, and lungs. And eventually he succumbed to his wounds, leaving behind a wife and two kids who will carry on his reign of tyranny in remembrance of their father who was taken from this planet too early. You have dealt a great blow to the organization known as the Iron Throne. A defeat that you are certain will not be ignored. Now you must travel to the great city of Baldur's Gate, where you are certain to find the truth behind the strange plot that plagues the citizens of the Sword Coast. Tonight you dream of blood. Not of blood on a blade or the blood on your hands but an ichor that runs as a torrent through the realms, a flood that pours across the fields and forests, an ocean that floats you to the world's edge and threatens to cascade off into the void. This blood seems a frightening thing, a massive force that sweeps away all resistance. As a whole, it is a monster and it cannot be stopped. Were it to be viewed from on high, it would seem to cover the entire world in its red black embrace you however do not have such a lofty perch from within the deluge you can see it does not move as one but is filled with currents eddies and undertoes pockets of calm afford breathing space whilst violent whirlpools threaten to rend limb from limb 
Ultimately, it seems undirected and lacks a driving will, a quality you have in abundance. You may be caught within, but sufficient determination can shape what you need to survive. There are still options open, still choices to be made. As the tide presses forward, you steer as you wish, atop a ship called Persistence and under sails made of resolve. A sudden and deliberate wave puts an end to your course and to the dream. It would seem that the Flood does have some will and took offense to your enjoying the ride. After flooding a mine with dead bodies, the gates of Baldur's Gate will open up and will finally be in the place that bears the name in the game. Baldur's Gate is a big ass place. And it comprises nine different area maps, each with several entrances, stores, and so on, including a whole network of sewers. And that's cool, it really is, but this is the first time you'll run into it and the game is quite literally almost over. The way you navigate this map is frustrating. See, each district, so to speak, is separated by a clickable zone on the world map, which is unnamed. And since there's no information on the world map, you end up having to load the first area, look at the local map, determine that this isn't the place you need to be, and go look for the next area. It's hard to memorize what is where when you don't have a name to go with the image that you have in your head. And for that matter, this happens with nearly every map in the game that doesn't have a name. This happens because of the jobs that the two hemispheres of your brain handle. You know, one side is in charge of identifying objects by sight, and the other is charged with giving it a name. If the corpus callosum, which is the thin strands that connect these two hemispheres of the brain, and handle communication between one another, if this cord is severed, the person cannot identify faces with names. So, you can see how important it might be to have each area clearly labeled, even if you have to make up a new name, because we will associate what we see with the name you've given it. Would have been helpful in many cases of revisiting old areas if they were clearly labeled. Now, I know you've already gathered this, but for those that don't, I need to point this out. This is called Baldur's Gate enhanced edition. I put emphasis on that last part because it's important to point out that the only thing that is enhanced about this version is the fact that it works right out of the box. This issue with these maps all just sort of blending in with one another could have been easily fixed by naming areas or allowing the player to see the map of the area before loading in. But I don't think this game was easy to modify because the reason they didn't just combine the entire map of nine areas into one big mega map is because of engine limits. Areas can only be of a certain number of tiles and that size was pretty damn small. So it was probably difficult for Beamdog to actually do improvements, but I think that that was due to the original IP owner not really caring about the IP. I mean, Beamdog had the source code for BG1 because they told us publicly that they didn't have the source code for Icewind Dale 2 and therefore could not make an enhanced edition of it. So if you have the source code, you can increase the tile limit, you can increase the limits of your UI elements. I mean, all kinds of shit is possible when you have the source code, so why did you not? It's pretty tough to know what the budget for the enhanced edition was because it couldn't have been a whole lot because Baldur's Gate 1, 2, and Icewind Dale enhanced editions all came out within a year of one another. So not a whole lot of time or money seemed to be dedicated to those games. If all you care about is playing the game the way it was released, that'd be one thing, but Beamdog intentionally added content, so why not add some quality of life fixes while you're at it? I know people complained about this because after this game came out, other CRPGs would always make sure that the town maps were always filled in and each district named because when you first enter Baldur's Gate, you're once again subjected to my favorite Baldur's Gate minigame, and that is wipe all the crap off my windshield. Baldur's Gate is a place of freedom. In fact, you have lots of freedoms because there's no law enforcement. Sure, there's the flaming fist, but those guys are mercenaries. You know what their number one job is? To keep riffraff out of the upper city where all the dukes and nobles live. And they're not doing a good job because I just came from there. And the Flaming Fist isn't really expanded on. They are introduced, and yes, you work for them, but they just seem like an order of knights to any clod who walks into the Forgotten Realms off the street. What makes Baldur's Gate special is its politics. You can believe and worship whatever god you want. Undead gods, evil gods, it's all fair game to Baldur's Gate. Just don't mess with the nobility, and we'll all get along fine. Everybody in this town wants to stop to talk to you, and even more of them want to throw a fetch quest in your face and clutter up your journal with dumb shit. Then another guy stops you and says, Hey there, mister! 
by the way, my friend poisoned you, and to keep me from doing something like telling you that you've been poisoned, he put a Gius on me. And I'm telling you anyway. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Anyway, instead of being like, you know, an effective poison, it won't kill you immediately. You got 10 days to figure out a cure, but by the way, there is no cure, and no priest can cure it because I said so. Now go fuck yourself. <laughs> all right, all right, see you later, buddy. Then I spent about an hour scouring every single area in the city looking for the House of Umberly and eventually giving up and just looking it up on the internet. Distraction after distraction will lead you down the same inevitable conclusion which is a fight out with the Iron Throne at their headquarters. And this place doesn't put up much of a fight until you get to the fourth floor that is. And after that you get sent on a series of goose chases, fetch and kill quests, and at some point you'll be trusted enough to talk to Duke Eltan. And he's going to give you the same mission, go beat the hell out of the Iron Throne until you find some evidence. You'll find a note, and that note will conveniently tell you about a meeting at Candlekeep. But once you get there, you'll be stopped by about 20 or so people who want to reminisce with you. And at this point in the game, I was pretty much speeding up to get to the end because this is where the game falls asleep on the couch. So all these role-playing opportunities just ended up being annoyances to me. Upstairs, the Iron Throne is holding the meeting with all the leaders in the same room. We need to find that meeting, find out who the armored goon is, and who hired him. The Iron Throne is our only lead. So naturally, the first thing I do when I meet him is kill him in full view of innocent bystanders. Now just look at how much chaos one mage can cause. What is it this time? For the glory of Helm! That's likely to kill about four level zero NPCs. I mean, those guys are gonna lose so many hit points that they're gonna have to die and be resurrected just so they can die again. Unsurprisingly, we're arrested for killing like six people and all the collateral damage that ensued after and they give us a chance to explain ourselves but we don't even try to deny it and it's like whatever man they threw the first lightning bolt and they've been starving the sword coast of iron but but well, some people are real fans of the law you know what i mean like they're in a committed relationship with the law and it'd be cheating if i let this street urchin run off with this loaf of bread better beat him to death in the name of the law so we're set up and left in a prison cell until we can be transported back to Baldur's gate but before that can happen a guy in a red robe teleports us to the super dangerous place below the library instead of out front of the place because as he tells us there's too many dudes out there waiting for us so which way do you think i exit after i leave the underground catacombs if you said right past the front door you'd be correct you don't win anything but if you want put your hand up to the monitor screen and i'm gonna put mine up to mine and it'll be like we're high-fiving through the internet okay here it goes three two one once we get back to Baldur's Gate, we're dismayed to find out that the Duke has fallen ill, our favorite flaming fister got shanked, and the armored douchebag is going to become the Grand Duke. Now, listen friends, I love this game, but let us consider for a moment that these people thought it was a good idea to believe that this is a trustworthy guy. I'm no magician in real life, but I can look at this guy and tell that there's something supernaturally wrong with him. You know, he's got glowing eyes and armor that makes him look like the devil's bodyguard. And these guys see him step into a room and instead of having the same reaction that any normal person might have, which is to say, if you saw this guy coming down your side of the street, you'd cross just to avoid walking past him. These guys and gals see this hulking ogre looking man and think, finally, a politician politician we're voting for. And as a result of these inbred lunatics poor decision making, I'm getting arrested again by the guy who took over after our boy Scar bit the dust. As soon as we come to, our door is open and the guy who did it, man, he's a child murderer. Man, this game loves killing kids. This guy right here, he wants us to guess how many kids he killed. And you'll never guess how many. 34. He killed 34 street kids. Isn't that nice? What a helpful fella. C cleaning up the streets like that. He shows us another way out of our cell and now we have to traverse the sewers and find some sort of clue as to what Saravok's plans are. So we head over to the Iron Throne headquarters again just to see if we luck out. And we find one of Saravok's ladies of the night and she put up a good fight, but he who has a wand of fear wins the fight and she eventually dies, huddled in a corner surrounded by summoned gnolls. This game loves communicating the most important and Info via notes, but when it comes to Saravok's plans, surely you're thinking there's no way he went and wrote down everything he was doing. I mean, that would be ridiculous, but you're not gonna believe this. He did! Had it all written down in this little fuzzy My Little Pony diary, but it looks like he took a magic marker to it and painted all the ponies like goths and glowworms. It even had one of those cute little padlocks on it that are more for decorating than protecting your intimate thoughts. And even though it was just for show, I still failed to picklock the goddamn thing. 
Tonight you sleep hunted by all, and wake in a dream hunted by one. Tonight you are the monster everyone claims you are, the kobold scorned like a rodent. The ogre that children fear comes in the night. The mobs and their torches now come for you, counting you among the creatures you once did hunt, or so someone would have you believe. Once again you hear the voice, a voice that now makes no secret of its origins. It speaks of destiny and nature, and of evil's bread in the bone. It says you will never be free of the mob, that they will hunt you for what you are. Murder and death run through your heart, and accepting that will supposedly give you power. The essence of ball within you cannot be ignored. But you have not ignored it. You realize that from the first you have fought the very blood in your veins, fought dagger and claw for each victory, and ultimately you have triumphed. With righteous will, you have turned the dark forces within you to good purpose. Whatever the foundation of your being, you have remade yourself in your own image. Amidst threats it does not yet know are empty, the voice tries to play upon your doubts, but finds none. As you stare unwavering, the presence grows weaker and weaker. As it fades from your mind, one warning does stand out amidst the din. It speaks of others that will listen where you have not, others that will embrace what you have rejected, and others that will be your death. This describes but one man, and you know of no other it could be. He who orchestrated your fall, deceived your comrades, and deserves all that your justice shall meet upon him, Saravak. He is a debt that must be paid to the whole of the Sword Coast. You awake sure of your cause, and of what must be done. Turns out that Saravok just couldn't help but blog about his plans, and now we have the proof we need. But this coronation event for Saravok is strictly invite only. I tell the guard that my brother's in there and I just needed to bring him his coat, but this guy was having none of that, so I came up with another plan. See, when that hooker from before was dying and laying in my arms bleeding, she told me that two of Saravok's people were in a place called the Undercellar. Which I, once more, had to go look up on the internet, even though I had already been there once before and never realized it was called the Undercellar. But the good news is, I cleaned up that infestation problem in the sewers pretty damn thoroughly. So we meet up with Saravok's assassins, it's a guy and some chick he's banging, and one of them's invisible. The woman. And I think this is symbolism for how men don't see women. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, I, I can't even do that. Anyway, when they die, you find a note from Saravok on a dude's body that says, You can come, but you better keep your bitch on a leash. <sighs> Oof, alright, so, uh, you know, read the subtext, I guess. So with your invitation in hand, you head over to the coronation, and there's a lot of people here who really aren't people at all. They're doppelgangers, and boy, let me tell you, this fight was a real nail-biter, right down to the last moment. And then this guy is like, I'll teleport you to wherever he is, and I'm thinking, uh, nah, hang on, and, and no, hang on, you go now, bye! Poof! So we end up in what is probably the least well-thought-out area imaginable, I mean, I think I remember the thief skill talking about the maze that you're in like it's some sort of training ground for new recruits, but it's all these long ass hallways with traps and jellies and a door to the chapel of ball. Like how the hell do you go from here to there? And not only that, but find another group of people that got here before you, but they didn't see Saravok run in just before you did, which means they got here seconds before we did, or they saw Saravok run by, waved high, and just forgot that they were there to get him in the first place. So instead of doing that, they try to kill me, which makes sense. I mean, they are from the Iron Throne, and I did kind of wreck their shit a little while ago. And this fight was very hard. In fact, the next two fights are a bit ridiculous. So I cheesed the hell out of this one, and Saravok, well... I just lit his ass up with some clever use of arrows of detonation. I mean, just look at this. So before Saravok even hits the ground, a cutscene plays, and this is your ending. Bask in it.
Then we see a statue of Saravok in... Alright, I, I feel like this doesn't stack up to the original ending at all, and I felt that way even though I don't remember anything about the original ending. So I went and found the original ending, and it's, uh... It's way better. And not just better, there's all kinds of details, like the fact that Seraphok is just one of many of Ball's children. It's revealed by the camera panning up on all those statues of various people and creatures that Ball made thorough acts of lovemaking, as the Christians like to call it. Even the demi-human ones, which sounds like something you'd only see on the internet and never unsee. So I would say that, compared to one another, this ending isn't enhanced at all. In fact, it's worse. So, would I recommend Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition? Eh, yeah, it's a stable port of the beloved game that is just as difficult as I remember it, and almost as charming as my nostalgia wants me to believe it was. It was a high early watermark for CRPGs and pointed to a direction a genre would go in for years. And despite a few hiccups with early progression, which is really the fault of both the design and the rule set they used, the game holds up and, in my opinion, excels at what modern CRPGs can only hope to emulate. Now, who's up for some Fallout New Vegas DLCs? I'll be posting a poll to YouTube later to find out what format that it should be in. I'm either going to tackle them all at once in an hour and a half video, or do each DLC in a single hour long video. Either way, let me know. There will probably be another video between here and New Vegas, because I'm likely going to need some time for that. So, question and answer time. So, someone on Twitter asked me this. They asked uh, a question I was thinking about just entirely out of curiosity. As a game dev, if you could make one change about Symphony of War, what would it be and why? Uh, I wouldn't say there's really a whole lot I would change about it. It scratches a very particular itch for a type of game that we don't normally get anymore. I mean, for some people, that's for like games like Fire Emblem. And for me, it's for games like Shining Force. Uh, the game is fine the way it is, but if you're asking about improvements, all I would end up saying is like, oh gee, I wish, you know, they did it this way, but the way they did it was fine. I had a lot of fun with it. I prefer games like this to be more expert exploration based outside of combat as a way to take a break from being on rails and instead I'd like to be in charge of what I care about and what I don't care about but most of all just be able to explore the environments that these stories take place in. I feel like I like feeling like I'm in a world of life instead of a world of menus. I don't know if that makes sense. Like linear games need to take a break from linearity every once in a while and let the player decide the pace now and then. But again, this is a preference thing. A reviewer might present his ideas as the right or wrong way, but at the end of the day, there is no right or wrong in it. It's about what works or doesn't for your particular taste. And sometimes it just means you're bad at games. Why is it so hard for me to enjoy real time? That's a good question. Uh, real time has really shitty mechanics, man. You know, like real time, you uh, you age and aging just sucks, right? You know, uh, on top of looking uglier, measurably uglier, uh, you start to lose things that you used to have, like hair and uh, the ability to walk down the block without getting winded. You know, shit like that. But I mean, just in daily interactions, you know what I mean? Like, you don't got a quick save option. I think that if the developers of life had uh, implemented a quick save feature, I think we'd all be better off. I think we can all agree on that, right? You know, being able to go back and redo conversations would be awesome. I mean, it'd probably get laid a hell of a lot more. I could tell you that, you know what I mean? You could just like quick save before a date and just try out all kinds of interesting techniques. <laughs> I'll, I'll reload my save and then I'll try this. I'll compliment her ass when she walks past me and I'll see if that worked. No, that didn't work. All right, let me try something else. If life were more like video games, it would be better, I think. Oh, what are your thoughts on retro graphics? Well, let me tell you, sir. My thoughts on retro graphics is that they're pretty awesome because they're the only kind of graphics I can do. Uh, <laughs> so recently I started a thing where I'm doing like 365 days of art and I started using the game that I've been working on as a as a way to 
motivate myself to keep doing art every day. And um, I ended up just doing a bunch of recently like pixel art and uh, retro 3D stuff. And uh, we finally got our game up to the point where, uh, you know, we have a working uh, camera system. It's gonna be a fixed camera system, like, uh, you know, the original Resident Evil games. It's got a PS1 aesthetic. Uh, you know, eh, it's looking pretty good. So uh, yeah, my opinion is I like them. I like them just fine. <laughs> I like them because they allow me to do art and not look like a total asshole when I do it. Uh, what's your favorite alcoholic beverage? Favorite alcoholic beverage? Jesus, man, I don't know. It used to be uh, Long Island iced tea. It had nothing to do with anything like taste or any shit like that. It was just that it could get me fucked up the fastest. Like anything that I could drink like three of and only pay like 12 bucks. Cause like in Delaware, you could get a Long Island that is basically an entire glass of four different liquors with like a shot of Coke and a shot of uh, sour mix. <laughs> and it would be $4, you know? So you get fucked up on the cheap. So I got addicted to those real early on. Um, but as I've gotten older, um, you know, heartburn <laughs> is a real concern. So, uh, I don't really drink anymore. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Yeah. So I don't, I don't really do any of that anymore. Like I said, you know, real time life, fucking shitty, man. <laughs> it's just taking things away from you every day. You know, one day you go sit down and you take a shit and it really hurts and you're like, okay. And now I know I can't eat hot wings anymore. So that's cool. That's just another thing I used to like that I can't do anymore. Life sucks. Happy hurricanes.